Hey everybody, Tom Judd here. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Matt Beretich, who's a friend and a clinical engineer of excellence for nearly 50 years. In fact, the last 25 years, he's been president of his own company, providing professional CE services through managing devices through their life cycle and also forensic engineering to identify causes of root, uh, root causes of accidents and avoid their recurrence. Uh, Dr. Beretich's uh, CV is really uh, long and powerful for CE roles for 20 years in a couple states here in the U.S. I got a doctorate in uh, health and uh, hospital and health administration after a master's in biomedical engineering. He's certified in five different areas of PE, CCE, uh, health facilities manager, health risk management, professional patient safety. He's uh, one of the founders and past president, as well as a fellow of ACCE, as well as AIMBE and ASHE. He's won several awards, most recently the ACC Hall of Fame this past year. Um, he's uh, taught across uh, Latin America in our advanced clinical engineering workshops on many different uh, journal uh, reviews and involvements, including the Journal of Clinical Engineering's editorial board today. And he actually consulted for my organization, Clinical Engineering at Kaiser Permanente on risk management several years back. He and his wife, Denise, moved to Canada in 2021. She's a public health nurse, and they both wanted to experience working in a country that sees healthcare as a right. And lastly, his uh, favorite hobby is bicycle touring and backpacking. And he, uh, he had an idea you know, when he was younger to bicycle from Iowa to Colorado, and then he did it. So take it away, Matt. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you all today. I'm uh, coming to you from my office in Vancouver General Hospital in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. And it's a nice day starting into spring here. Today, the topic is about managing medical device incidents. And this is from the perspective of an organization, of the healthcare organization that each of us works in and how the organization will manage and deal with uh, medical device related incidents that occur. I should start with a, a definition of what I mean by a medical device incident. And when I do that, I think about a scenario where there's a patient care provider, say a nurse or a doctor or a respiratory care technician who is trying to achieve some clinical objective. By that, I mean the clinician is trying to do diagnosis or treatment or therapy or monitoring or some kind of objective. And to accomplish that objective, the clinician needs a medical device. And of course, this is true for many situations where clinicians are interacting with patients somewhere in the picture. There's a medical device, but for some reason, the clinician's not able to achieve that objective. And I believe this in a very broad sense that it's not blaming the care provider. It's not assuming that the medical device has failed. It's not making any assumption in this definition about exactly what the cause was. That's something yet to be determined. But if these, such, these characteristics occur, then we've got, an, we've got a failure to achieve a clinical objective. And here's the, the final point that makes it a, an incident or an adverse event. Somehow harm occurs. And the harm could be uh, harm to the patient. It could be harm to the user of the equipment. It could be harm to the facility. Uh, but anything that in this picture goes wrong and causes trouble, then that represents a medical device incident. So how does the organization deal with a situation like that? The very first thing is, seems obvious, take care of the patient. Um, some of us who as engineers and technicians are thinking the first thing is take care of the medical device, but that's of course not the right answer. The right answer is to make sure, get the, get the equipment out of the way and take care of the patient so that uh, the patient is uh, and anybody else in the environment is safe. I want to tell you just a couple of slides about uh, two different cases with using 
this uh, same three channel infusion pump. And what I want you to look at is across the center of that device, there's kind of a shelf there. And there are a couple of problems with that is it tends to collect uh, fluids the uh, infusion medication, for example, and because of its uh, mechanical design tends to break. And if we look closer, in both of these cases that I was involved in doing investigations on, there was a crack that occurred. There's some evidence of someone trying to repair it, but being uh, unsuccessful. And when the fluid leaked onto this little shelf, it leaked down through this crack into the electronics down below and got down to this uh, electronic component, which normally gets pretty hot. But the fluid uh, started to, uh, to burn and smoke started rolling out of this infusion pump. And so appropriately, what the nurse did in each case was to roll the pump away from the patient out into the hallway. And in one case, the nurse called the fire department. And so that's the right thing to do. But very quickly, the next thing becomes some sort of internal reporting that is within the organization where that adverse event, that incident gets reported to people who can investigate it and manage it for the organization. There are different ways to do that. It can be as simple as a phone call to the risk management department, or it could be more extensive. Here at uh, Vancouver General Hospital, there's a computer system that uh, lets you um, pull this up. And if I experience the event, then I can just pick what kind of event it was. And then it will go on to ask uh, a lot of detailed questions about the incident. And that gets reported to a central uh, group uh, associated with risk management and patient safety to analyze the ones that are uh, particularly the ones where someone was seriously injured or in some unfortunate cases where someone might have have died. So th there will be some kind of internal reporting process in your organization. So it's important as, as engineers that we understand how that works in whatever organization that we work in. Once you've done the internal reporting, then this is uh, a key issue for medical device related incidents. And it's unique to incidents where a medical device is involved. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of adverse events in healthcare facilities. There are uh, drug medication errors. There are uh, in, um, imperfections in the delivery of care, the standard of care. There are all kinds of sorts of things. But the unique thing about having a medical device involved is that this third step where you need to sequester the device, which means take it out of service and put it aside somewhere, preferably, particularly if it's a critical event and there was a lot of harm, but take it out of service and lock it up somewhere so that any evidence is, uh, is preserved. The evidence to preserve includes not just the device, but any of the disposables, uh, the infusion sets for an infusion pump, it can also include the packaging if that's still available. And the reason is that a problem with the disposable may be uh, limited to certain lot numbers from manufacturing and the park packaging will say uh, which lot number had that particular problem. It's also important to preserve the settings however the user had set up the device. And sometimes, that conflicts with the number one, which is take care of the patient, because if something goes wrong, the user is probably going to make some adjustments and try to fix the problem, but that's okay. Just preserve the settings as they are at the end of the incident and also plug in the device. Many devices these days have uh, an internal um, log of events, uh, alarms and button presses and other things that are done. And some of those are um, lose, lose their memory if they lose power. 
So sometimes, if particularly if you think this may take a long time to finish the investigation, it's important to plug it in wherever it is that you store it. So after the device is sequestered, we go on to the next step, which is to preserve any of the patient data associated with the incident. And so that uh, it certainly includes any pa paper records, depending on how records are kept in your organization. It can be electronic medical records, which are, are becoming very widespread in many hospitals. There can also be that in information that I just mentioned, that there's in information about events and alarms that are often stored within the medical device itself. This is a, a ventilator that's used. I, I've been involved in two different cases where it was being used uh, at home with a ventilator dependent patient who was being cared for by a family member. And so the problem in both of the cases that I investigated, uh, it, it, the, it was necessary to try to understand what was in the um, event and alarm logs. And fortunately, this is, this is a quite a good uh, ventilator, uh, but in this particular case, it had some operational problems. And so we were able to go through and go step by step in um, looking at the various uh, uh, events and alarms that had occurred around the time of this particular patient incident. And uh, if the device had been working properly, we could have uh, removed a little SD card that would have this on. In fact, this ventilator had some problems and it was necessary for to go screen by screen, there are 256 screens. This is number 50 of 256. And I was the person who ended up transcribing all of this information try, to try to understand what was happening. And you can put together quite a story of what sorts of alarms were occurring and what sorts of uh, efforts the user of the equipment made to try to rectify the problem and try to see where things uh, may have gone wrong. And then there's there's uh, investigation of the incident itself. Um, I've already talked a bit about that, and we've had other presentations in the GCA talks series. Uh, so I won't go a long way into this, but I'll just have a couple of slides about a very in interesting incident. This is a operating room table and what happened is that the surgery had begun the patient was on the, the table and anesthetized and the table started to move and the surgeon said to the nurse anesthetist who had the hand controls please stop moving the table and she said i am not moving the table and the table continued to move until it was in this configuration where the foot uh, end of the table folded up all the way to the mechanical stop and the head folded up all the way to the mechanical stop and it tipped over away from us in the in this particular screen and you can imagine that there was a significant uh, the, the immediate concern was to take care of that patient who was experiencing uh, this and it's it's a long story and and maybe you can invite me back for another gcea talk and uh, i can go into it in some more but the investigation because this as you can imagine turned into a lawsuit and so there was long investigation that had several parties and this is just the one photo i want to show you i was one of a number of engineers who were doing the investigation where essentially we took this apart and at every stage, we took pictures and videos and talked to each other and wrote notes. And uh, we also took some electrical measurements of, of voltages and pressures along the way. And it can become quite an involved. This was several hours of work. At some point, there's also the necessity of reporting externally, uh, meaning outside the organization. And that will vary depending on where you are in the US, you report to the Food and Drug Administration, that's a federal agency under these two particular um, 
uh, programs that the government runs. In Canada, it's through Health Canada. They have a reporting system that's uh, very similar to the FDA, but uh, quite a bit um, newer, more recent, as it turns out. And every country has some sort of way, uh, in most cases, of, of collecting this information with the intent of understanding what um, are there trends or patterns in the types of failures that are seen with medical devices. In the US, you can go to this free uh, online accessible uh, database called uh, the MOD database that uh, lets you look up very, with various factors um, the various reports that have been made. And what you're able to get is a report that um, uh, it will be de-identified. So you don't know which organization uh, entered the report, but it's a way to say, you know, I'm having trouble with this device. Are there other places that are having similar problems? And maybe we can, we can learn something about uh, what's occurring in other places. I want to mention just a few slides of, of uh, two cases that were very similar uh, where I, no one was hurt. And so it was not mandatory to report to the FDA, but I ended up recommending to the, the hospital that they voluntarily report. And the case here was, this is an electrosurgical unit, hand piece and two electrodes. And the blue one up there, the the the, uh, the orange lightning bolt is where the electrosurgical current is intended to be delivered from the device to the patient. But in the in both of these cases I worked on, the current was coming from the place where the the black lightning bolt uh, was as shown here. And it looks as though that electrode is pushed uh, in properly. And it turns out that it was not. If you look more closely, you can see that it was, um, there's a gap and it's actually possible to push it further in, but it's not obvious. There is some uh, restriction when you get this far. And so the user who inserts that electrode has to know exactly how hard to push, hard enough, but not too hard. And, and you can also see some evidence there of some uh, eschar, some burned tissue and some damage that was related to the current being uh, emitted from the electrosurgical unit to the patient at the wrong location. And the last point is just to avoid recurrences, to learn from the, the situation. Um, all of the work that we do for managing these incidents and investigating them is, is focused on making them less likely to occur in the future. In our organizations and in other organizations by our reporting to something like the FDA system. And so uh, that's the ultimate uh, learning objective for this process. And I'll, so I'll give one short example of how that worked out. This is a case from here at Vancouver General Hospital before I came to work here. And this many of you will recognize is a, an Alaris infusion pump system. And in the center is a, a large volume infusion pump module. And the way these works is that, uh, is, is that there's a, a tubing set that down the center in this picture, and it's a soft uh, tubing where the, the medication flows to the patient. And there are occluder devices that press down and control how much fluid can go through at what rate and what total volume. And there's some other safety systems. And the case that was occurring here at Vancouver General just about three years ago, uh, there were, um, many cases of overinfusion that were difficult to uh, determine the cause of. And so to make a very long story short, a long story that over months of collecting data before finally it turns out, I'll, I'll tell you the end of the story, which is that this, uh, these safety features of this pump depend on that uh, soft tubing being 
uh, round, circular, and the, having a uniform thickness of wall. And it turns out when you do the, um, when, when you uh, do an X-ray of those, actually CT in this case, the, it turns out that it, many cases, the tubing sets were not circular and the tubing wall was not of uniform thickness. And so depending on how it happened to be manufactured, that tubing could be in different orientations relative to those occluder devices. And sometimes it would work well and sometimes it would not work well to occlude the flow. And so in some cases, there was free flow of, of medication. And of course, some medication, a high volume of some flows, for example, opioids, uh, it can be very harmful uh, to patients. And the result of this was not just learning about this, but it ended up that the manufacturer recalled tens of millions, literally tens of millions of tubing sets, pulled them off the shelves from mostly the US, but Canada and a dozen other countries around the world. And this is probably the best of all outcomes, if you will. I mean, it was bad that it took a long time, but at the end, uh, the hospital knew this was the problem. Isn't It was clear what the root cause was and, and it was corrected. So that's my final example here. I'll just put up here the um, summary of the different recommendations I've made. And I will stop there and we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, I'm, I'm available live right now. Uh, and so we'll look at the questions that have come in on the, uh, on the chat line and I will do my best to answer those.